All right, sometimes when we do a sermon series like this one through a specific text like Ezra and Nehemiah, there's a couple ways you can go about it. Uh, so you might see us go chapter by chapter, and that's pretty systematic. Uh, it's a fun way to do it, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. It's fun because it's easy to follow. Now, the other way to do it is to look at the entire narrative of the story through Ezra and Nehemiah, because remember that was written originally as one book and now it's separated into two. And so it's one unified narrative that connects to the entire story of the entire Bible. And so we're pulling out themes from that and teaching from that. And so when you do that, it's super fun, but sometimes it can get a little tricky to follow. And so I have a slide just to remind you where we are at in this series. If you could throw that slide up on there on the screen. Uh, so week one and week two, we talked about, uh, yeah, there we go, discovering your purpose, how to find your purpose, how to find your calling. And so we specifically looked at, in week one, the life of Zerubbabel. And then in week two, we looked at the life of Ezra and Nehemiah. And we, we were like, okay, how did they find their purpose? How did they find their assignment? And then also, Bible application, how can we do the same? right? Because this is the living word of God. And so we don't want to take it and read it like completely external, far, far away, but we also don't want to take it completely internal because either way, you're going to miss something. If you take it completely external and read it like a sixth grade history book, then you're going to miss so much because it's the living word of God. It's not a dead word of a bunch of dead people who lived in a land far, far away. And so we have to read it like that. But also... The Bible wasn't written directly to you, but it was written for you. Amen? Okay. And so not totally external, not totally internal, but we want to exegete, which is the fancy scholar word for just, we want to like read the Bible for all it's worth and apply it to our lives as the living word of God, right? And so we looked at the life of Zerubbabel, the life of Ezra, and the life of Nehemiah, and we said, okay, how did they discover their, their purpose and their assignment, and how can we do the same by using their lives as a model? So that was week one and two. Week three, we talked about all of the unique resistance that these guys faced, and that God is the one who had called them to the assignment, and God is the one who kept them in that call and protected them and promised that he would keep their call. And then week four, Matt Reed was up here. Give it a hand for Matt Reed hanging out over there. <laughs> Matt Reed gave it, uh, a message from the perspective of a Christian life coach, and he re helped us redefine and understand the terms calling, purpose, and assignment. And it was really, really good, drawing on his own experiences. And that brings us to this morning, week five. Turn to your neighbor and say, week five. All right, I've got a few different scriptures that I wanna read, but for the most part, we'll be hanging out in Nehemiah chapter six. So if you've got your paper Bibles, shout out to the real ones with a paper Bible this morning. Turn to Nehemiah chapter six, and we're gonna be starting in the beginning, verse one. I'm praying that the Lord speaks to us through this today and uh, maybe even shifts things for you. As I was reading it through this past week, God did that for me, and that's all I'm sharing with you this morning is the things that he shared with me. All right, Nehemiah chapter six, verse one. Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and there was no breach, some translations say, or gap. I like gap just because it's easier. There was no gap left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates. Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come and let us meet together in Hecfirim in the plain of Ono. But they intended to harm me. Okay, pause there. One of the reasons that I love the book of Nehemiah specifically is because we, it's written in the first person almost as if we are opening up Nehemiah's journal. It has this journal-like feel to it. So he says, I had built the wall. There was no breach. There was no gap left in it. And he's not bragging. He's just more of excited and celebrating because this dude has been through a lot. And week three, week, yeah, week three, we went through all of the resistance 
literally from chapter two all the way to chapter six where we're at this morning, so much resistance, attack after attack after attack after attack. And so he's like, finally, I got the wall put up. There's no more gaps in it. And and so we went through that because it was a hard task. It was a hard project. It took them literally 80 years to even get here. And remember, remember the context, remember the background. So there's about 50,000 of them in exile in Babylon, and they want to return back to Jerusalem. And so they head back to Jerusalem just to find out that the city was in complete ruin and a big pile of rubble, totally destroyed. And so Zerubbabel first got the assignment. God was working in waves, just as he does a lot of times for us. Zerubbabel got the assignment to take a group and to rebuild the temple. And you can always remember that Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple from rubble because of rubble, be, rubble, be, rubble. You're welcome for that. <laughs> That's how my brain works. Okay, so Zerubbabel and the temple, rubble to temple. And then God assigned Ezra. After Zerubbabel had been there for a while, Ezra started preparing the people's hearts and reconciling them back to the heart of God. So the temple was in position. Now Ezra is assigned to reconcile and get the people ready. And that leads us to Nehemiah. Let's start over chapter six, verse one. Now when Sanballat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arab and the rest of our enemies heard that I had built the wall and there was no breach left in it, although up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates, Sanballat Sanballat and Geshem said to me saying, come and let us meet together in Hekfirim in the plain of Ono, but they intended to do me harm. And I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work, I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Okay, also I read read that and I'm like, Nehemiah literally missed the best, most easiest layup in pun history because they said, come to the plain of Ono. Why didn't he start his response with, oh no? Like that, okay, sorry. And, and I know that, like, that it only works in the English, but don't read into it, you scholarly people. Okay, so I'm gonna throw it in there. He didn't say it, he didn't say it. And I sent the messengers to them saying, oh no, turn to your neighbor and say, oh no. I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Verse four, and they sent to me four times in this way and I answered them in the same manner Now, I like that part a lot, four times. So four times they say, come down, come down, come down. down." No, 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 no. Over and over and over, they're trying to distract him. And that reminds me, or that at least gives me the indication, I don't always remember, that we don't fight spiritual battles just one time and never again, right? Sometimes they continue to happen over and over. So he's persistent though, because he's focused on his assignment. Verse five, in the same way, Sanballat for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. Interestingly enough, the open letter in his hand. Okay, so letters were typically rolled up like a scroll and sealed in some sort of fashion. Why was it open? It's because they wanted everybody to see what was written on the letter. They were trying to broadcast this message that they had. So for the first time, he sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand and it was written. It is reported among the nations, and Geshem also says it, that you and the Jews intend to rebel. And so that's why you're rebuilding the wall. That's why you're building the wall. And according to these reports, you wish to become their king. And so you have also set up prophets to proclaim concerning you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. And now the king will hear, there's, the actual king will hear these reports. So now, again, come and let us take counsel together. Verse eight, Nehemiah, then, then I sent to him saying, no such things as you say have been done for you're inventing them out of your own mind. You're just making it up. For they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, oh God, strengthen my hands. Okay, so we're reading this. We've got two things happening. We've got Nehemiah's making progress for God. All the while, he receives an invitation from the enemy at the same time. And remember, 
he's experienced in getting attacks from the enemy from chapter two all the way to here. He's been making progress. He's getting this wall built because he's thinking, if I get this wall built, we can have an educational system. If I get this wall built, then the tax money can actually go to what we're trying to do. If I get this wall built, we can worship freely. We can work freely without being distracted or, or having no protection from the enemy. We got to get this wall built. So now comes a question. We're taking it all the way from 5th century to 2024. And we ask the question, what do you do when you're making progress for God, but an invitation from the enemy comes? And not a physical enemy typically, right? Because our battle is not of flesh and blood. But Nehemiah said the enemies came and asked for a meeting, but he knew what they really wanted. They wanted to pull him away from his assignment and they wanted to kill him. No, that's the context of it. But that's not what they said, was it? They didn't, they didn't tell him their plan, like, hey, Nehemiah, come down off the wall so that we can pull you away from the assignment so that we can uh, take you back into the woods and murder you so that we can slip through the, the doors that you haven't put up yet. They didn't tell them their plan. They didn't tell him their plan, right? The enemy doesn't tell him their plan. The enemy doesn't tell you the whole plan of death and destruction he has for your life, does he? He just gives you an invitation. Hey, just step away. Are you, is that, did God really call you to that? That, that situation that uh, you don't see any way out of? Hey, let's replay every scenario of how it could possibly go wrong. Hey, just, just come talk to us. Hey, do you see what everybody else is doing? Just, just stop with your, God didn't really, did he just, just come talk to us. Often the enemy doesn't reveal that he's pulling us down to death and destruction. It's just an invitation to step away and talk. But none of what they were saying about Nehemiah was true on that open scroll, on that open letter. And none of what the enemy tries to sell you is true either. It's just a bunch of lies, but it's the invitation of distraction to listen to other things, to engage in other things, with other things makes you step out of what God has called you and given you to do. So while he's making progress for God, the enemy gives him an invitation. And the way that he responds to that invitation is going to be the most important thing for what happens next. Because remember, he's, he's built the wall. He's just got to get the doors in. That is the last, the last step until his assignment is fully complete. And I noticed, okay, when did, the, when did the attacks start speeding up? Four or five times. When did they happen? It wasn't when Jerusalem was in a big pile of rubble. It was when he started making progress. Does that resonate? When we start to actually follow what God has for us, and we step into our assignment, and we stop pursuing the things of our flesh, and we pursue the things of the Spirit of God and what he wants, then we start to notice the attack and the invitation of the enemy, right? But as soon as he started making progress, that's when I came. The wall was built, the doors weren't in yet. He said, I was vulnerable to the attack in that moment because the doors weren't there yet. So I'm reading this this week, and <laughs> the Lord is so kind and bold that he started reminding me of all the times in my own life that I've been tempted with distraction. And it can take on many, 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 many forms are you with me? Distraction can take on many forms. Distraction in the enemy in my own life has looked like um, doubt, has looked like feeling like I am not worthy enough to do the assignment that he's called me to. I deal with that, honestly, coming up here. There's probably somebody else better for the job. Or lacking priorities, that's a big one for me, is in the moment, I think everything is just so, so, so important when it's really not. And I get distracted on all of these things just to find out later that it has pulled me away from what God has actually asked me to do. And my wife, Tori, she's so, so kind, and that's why she can say this stuff, but we're sitting at the dinner table, planning out our month, what have we been up to, what do we have on the calendar ahead, and I'm starting to just spout off all these brilliant ideas that I have and all these things that I would like to do, and oh my gosh, can you believe if we started this or we did this with our neighbors and all this stuff? And, and she looks at me and she's like, is God asking you to do that? 
What is the Holy Spirit asking you to prioritize? I get distracted easily. And remember, the distractions might not stop after the first time. Nehemiah saw it his entire assignment. No, he was following God. God will protect. He was still attacked, right? Over and over and over, four times. Nehemiah, just stop what you're doing. No. Nehemiah, just come talk to us. No. Did God really say, no, come on, just, no, no. And for you and for me, The attacks will come, and I'm aware of that, and I know that, and how do I know that? Because you're breathing. Because you're above ground, and we're not at your funeral this morning. So we can assume that the attacks will come. But I'm reading this, and this week I'm just asking myself, how did Nehemiah know? How did he know? How did did Nehemiah know to say no? Oh no, how, like how did he know? How did he know when the, when the enemy just, hey, let's talk? Because as a recovering people pleaser myself, I would say, oh, you just wanna talk? Okay, let's go, whatever will make you happy, right? Like I would have, I would have struggled to go. How did he know to say no? How did he know that when the enemy just said, hey, let's talk, and he was just kind of scheming and plotting to pull him away? How did he know that what they were really doing was trying to pull him away from the assignment that God has given him, take him into the backwoods, murder him, and slip through the doors and destroy the city. How did he know? That's the question this morning. Because he told them no, how many times? Four times. He was certain of his answer. He said in verse three, and I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? When the enemy came to steal his focus and keep him from being faithful in his assignment, Nehemiah said, oh no, I'm doing a great work and I will not stop. That phrase, good work, let's take a look at that. This is actually a recap from uh, weeks one and two. Caleb talked about this. Good work refers to our assignment to do a good work. This is the thing that the Lord is stirring up in you deep down. He's stirring it up in your heart. He's equipped you. He's called you to this assignment. He's gonna call you and he's gonna keep his promises and he's stirring it up. But here's the thing. We read the same phrase in Ephesians chapter two. Ephesians chapter two says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works for which God has prepared an advance for us to do. Go ahead and put that uh, graphic up on the screen with the circles. Ephesians says, God has prepared in advance good works or assignments for you to do. Uh, my, my Hebrew keyboard wasn't working because I don't have one of those. So it doesn't, you don't have the, the Greek or the Hebrew up there, but I tried my best. <laughs> that same phrase though, good work in Ephesians 2, is exactly what Nehemiah is talking about in chapter 6 and his response to the enemy. So all this has happened, and Nehemiah, enemy after enemy, attack after attack, staying focused on his purpose, on his assignment. Once again, Nehemiah, how were you able to do this? Despite the invitations from the enemy, how did you know to say no? And really, what we're asking this morning is, how do I know to say no? How do I know to say no to the distractions and to the lies? How do I know to say no? That's the question. And so we really, to to see this, we gotta take it all the way back to the beginning, to Nehemiah chapter one. This is how Nehemiah was able to stay focused and faithful to his assignment. This is how we too can stay focused and faithful to our assignment. Nehemiah chapter one, nothing has happened yet, at least Nehemiah thinks so. Nehemiah finds out about the state of Jerusalem. It's in a big pile of rubble. And so what does he do when he finds out? Take a look. Nehemiah chapter one, verse four. It says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And then I said, so this is Nehemiah's prayer when he finds out the state of Jerusalem. 
He says, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant who is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. God, I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's family, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly towards you. We have not obeyed the commands, the decrees and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction, God, that you gave your servant Moses, saying, if you're unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations, which is what happened. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. God, they're your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. This man he's talking about is the king. And then he says, I was cupbearer to the king. When Nehemiah heard about Jerusalem and the state that it was in, just a big pile of rubble, what did he do? He prayed. Well, first it says he wept, and then he prayed, and then he fasted, and God began to stir up his heart. Because how do I know? The end of that prayer, God grant me success in this. And success in what? in the thing that he's stirring up his heart to do. He wept. God was breaking his heart for what breaks his. And so then he prays this prayer. And part of me, again, like, I feel like, I, I feel like I shouldn't even be reading this prayer because it's so vulnerable. It's like we're literally opening up Nehemiah's prayer journal. And so he prays this vulnerable prayer. He got, he's like, God, I know, I know the Israelites have failed you. Even my own family has failed you. And God, I, I've failed you. But God, would you hear my prayer? God, I'm sorry. I confess that I've fallen short. I need you. God, and I remember your promises. And I know that you're stirring my heart for Jerusalem. So God, if you would, help me be successful in this assignment. What's he do? He weeps. He realizes that he's fallen short. He prays. He repents. He fasts. And he surrenders. I'm starting to realize that this mirrors the prayer for salvation. God, I've fallen short. I have failed you. God, I need you. I am desperate for you. I surrender it all, all I am, all I have, everything. I give it to you and I lay it at your feet. God, reconcile my heart back to yours. God, and prepare me and give me power to do a good work. God, give me an assignment. And at, this, at the end of this vulnerable, vulnerable prayer with God, there's this random sentence that Nehemiah says after his prayer. At least I, it seemed random when I first read it. But the longer that I prayed through it and I worked through it, the Lord, I'm telling you, he wrecked me because this random sentence, it's not random at all. Okay, this is so cool. This is how God really, really works. And he'll do the same thing in your life. Watch this. He says at the end of his prayer, I was cupbearer to the king. What's he saying? Cupbearer. Well, okay. A cupbearer, some people would call that a wine taster. And now some of you are very interested. Oh, a wine taster, I would like that job. <laughs> but this is no Napa Valley wine taster, okay? This is Nehemiah's job prior to everything happening. This was his paycheck. Nehemiah was a wine taster for the king. The same king, get this, this is the same king who he needed permission, the next chapter, chapter two, he needed permission from to rebuild the wall. So a cupbearer or a wine taster, what in the world would he do? 
I came to demonstrate that for you the best I could. So this is wine straight from the valleys, the deep depths of <laughs> with notes of cherry and dirt and all kinds of good stuff that's in wine. I don't really know. No, I'm just kidding. It is legitimately diet cranberry juice, but it's for the, uh... okay. Look how fancy that looks. All right. So wine, wine taster, cup bear. All right. So what they would do, king's at his dinner party, all right? And they're pouring the king, oh gosh, a glass of wine, definitely not diet cranberry juice. Is that how much you should put in a cup of wine? I don't know. Long weekend. So <laughs> here's the cup. Here you go, King Artaxerxes. Here's your cup of wine. What's he do? He hands the cup to Nehemiah. Nehemiah takes it because he's the cup bearer of the king, and he grabs his ladle. This is the official ladle uh, that Nehemiah would use. Not really. Uh, it's from Target. And then, so what he would do is, this wine glass is too skinny at the top, but he would take the ladle, and he would scoop out the top of it. All right, so. Okay. He would take just the top of the wine, and he'd drink it. Nehemiah would drink Oh, that is diet. Okay. <laughs> All right. Why would he do that? Because if the wine was poisoned by the enemy of the king, then Nehemiah would be the first to die instead of the king. Now, how many of you want this job? <laughs> right? Okay, so he was the taste tester of the poisonous wine. And he, literally his job was to every single day just drink wine and just pray to God that he doesn't die from the poison that may or may not be in it. That was his, that was his job. That was Nehemiah's job. I hope that for Alex's sake that doesn't knock over. Okay. But the crazy thing about the cupbearer too is that because they worked so closely day in and day out with the king, that they, they started developing this relationship with them. I mean, I would hope so. He's literally basically your guinea pig, right? And so if the king liked you, you would start to honestly gain a little level of authority in the kingdom, especially if he liked you. So Nehemiah, day in and day out, this was his job to make sure that the, the king didn't get poisoned. He was a cupbearer, and he worked side by side with the king for years doing this. So we know from the very next chapter, chapter two, that after his prayer, Nehemiah had asked the king for permission to rebuild the wall. And this was a bold request because this, this is the king, this was his boss, but this was also the king that put a, a stop work order on the, building, or the rebuilding of Jerusalem. He said, you're not gonna rebuild it. I want the tax dollars from that. Leave it a pile of rubble. There's absolutely no one to work on this, on this project. But Nehemiah, there's a problem because he's working for that guy, but also the Lord is stirring up his heart for an assignment to literally do that. And God knew. He, <laughs> he knew that it was only Nehemiah that could accomplish this task or this assignment. Why? Why? Because God prepares, Ephesians chapter two, God prepares in advance the assignment for us to do. God had put Nehemiah in the position of cupbearer so that year after year after year after year, he would be developing this underlying friendship and trust with the king so that eventually he would have favor with him for when it came time to carry out his assignment. Do you see that? God has orchestrated this whole thing out. If he hadn't worked so closely with the king for years, then he wouldn't have had favor to get the yes from the king to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. So we find him in Nehemiah chapter one, flat on his face in prayer. God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I failed you for generations. We failed you. God, hear me though. Let me rebuild what we've broken. And God says, what I'm stirring up for what I'm stirring up in your heart for right now. I've been planning. I've been preparing for you this entire time and you didn't even know it. And this is our God. 
You thought it was a meaningless job and you thought it was just a paycheck to a means to an end to feed your kids. You thought you had no big purpose and you believed the lies of the enemy. But this entire time, what you didn't know is these small little things that have been happening in your life have been God using this and preparing and making a way and equipping you for the assignment that you are called to do. Amen? Because this is how God works. Every time you feel like you don't have direction, every time, oh, I'm not really hearing God, I, I, I don't, he doesn't have anything big planned for me, by the way, are all lies from the enemy himself. God is behind the scenes, behind enemy lines, putting it all together and making a way for you. What, me, what Nehemiah didn't see and what we don't realize is that the entire time God has been preparing you for something because it is the Lord who goes before you, it is the Lord who goes with you, and he will not leave you nor forsake you, amen? Ah. And Nehemiah finishes his prayer to God. God, help me be successful. Grant me success in this assignment. And then, and then he goes, wait a minute. I'm a cupbearer to the king. Wait a minute. It's this aha moment. God has been putting this together the entire time. He's been orchestrating this. He's been making a way. And so he gains this confidence. How did he know to say no? He gains this confidence that all began from a place of prayer from a place of fasting, from a place of mourning and the breaking of our heart and the place of intimacy with God. And the Lord speaks to him, Nehemiah, you're a cupbearer. I've been working on you. I've been putting you in places to prepare you for the next season and for the next assignment. I've been preparing in advance the work set out for you to do. For you are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And so Nehemiah, how did he say no to the enemy? To say no to the lies and to the distractions? He discovered from a deep place of intimacy that God had prepared in advance an assignment for him to do. And he knew in that assignment, God went before him, God was with him, and so he would remain focused and faithful to the end of the assignment. Nehemiah is like, oh no. Tell your neighbor, oh no, one more time. Oh no. Nehemiah is like, oh no, I'm not leaving. I'm staying four times. No, 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 no. And a fifth, no. This is what God has for me. I know it. He's been working it. I was a cupbearer, didn't know what the heck was going on, but he's been working and moving and preparing and making a way, and I will be found faithful. And this taught me an important truth. When the enemy speaks to me, when the enemy speaks to you, tries to pull you away and distract you from what God is doing in you and through you, he doesn't get to give us a command, only an invitation. While you're making progress from God and the enemy gives you an invitation, Nehemiah said, I was vulnerable to the attack in that moment because I was so close to being done, but the doors weren't in yet. And so the enemy gave him an invitation. Are you, are you sure this is what you're supposed to be doing? Did God really say, what's that sound like, Genesis? But this is the truth that we have to remember, is that the enemy doesn't get to give us a command, only a suggestion. He can't force you to do anything unless there's a, like a full possession involved here. But I, I, I literally heard somebody say once, I don't remember what it was about. I was trying to rack my, rack my memory I heard somebody say once, like, ah, oh, Dylan, but the, the devil made me do it. I'm like, I don't think he did, man. Like, I don't think, I think he probably gave you a suggestion or an invitation to the distraction. I don't remember what it was. But like an example is like, no, you were the one who went to Trader Joe's. You were the one who bought the two bags of chips instead of the one. And you were the one who put them in your cart checked out, and you ate them both before you got home. <laughs> okay, I'm a lover of dairy products. I went to Trader Joe's, grabbed a, a gallon of milk, and when I got home, Tori opened the fridge. She's like, what happened to the milk? Because I straight up drank a half a gallon of milk on the way home. 
I was so thirsty. I, I know, I dare you. Okay. <laughs> you did it. The devil didn't put him in your car. The devil didn't swipe his car. You did it. And I'm being PG with food, but I could go way deeper, especially if this was a men's conference. Delilah. Okay, we could talk about all kinds of stuff. <laughs> the enemy will try and use anything and everything to distract you and pull you away. I mean anything. Ultimately, when we're talking about this grand narrative of the whole biblical story, we see God rebuilding the city, but what we really can know is that God is also rebuilding your soul. The Old Testament, he had a temple for his people. The New Testament, he has a people for his temple. He's building a city and he's building your soul. Your soul is like a city. It's part of the unified story. Don't take my word for it. Proverbs says this. A lot of people think Solomon wrote Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 25, 28 says, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. A Trader Joe's. <laughs> self-control though, it can mean all kinds of things. It can mean food. It can mean addiction. It can mean looking at stuff you're not supposed to look at, being with people who you're not supposed to be with. Self-control on social media, all kinds of things. So if Solomon did write Proverbs, he would be the perfect one to tell us this. If you know the story of Solomon. So Saul was the first king of Israel and then came David after him and then Solomon, David's son, took the throne. But the Bible says Solomon, he was like one of the wisest men in the land, but that's confusing because he had 700 wives and I don't understand how that works. But it says some of these wives, some, some of these foreign women literally turned his face from God, turned his heart from God and distracted him, turned his eyes away from what he was called to do. And we can, we are way easily influenced than we think, right? We are influenced way more than we realize. Like a city without walls, these distractions often come in many, many different forms. We start to think about any thought, believe any lie, any impulse, anything we want to look at, watch, let into our ears, our mouth, our eyes, any distraction, and we let it steal us away from what God truly has for us, what he's assigned us to do in this season, and what he has already made a way for But just because he invites you doesn't mean you have to go. Now, if you don't belong to Jesus, it probably feels like you have to go. Probably feels like you gotta go. Like there's no other option. Like, ah, oh, man, this is just what life is. This, I, I don't, and that's where the hopelessness starts to set in. Because the Bible says without Jesus, you are a slave to sin. But if you do belong to Jesus, you are not under any authority of the enemy. So if Jesus purchased you with his blood, Satan doesn't get to just throw a command at you and call you off the seat next to being seated with Jesus into this state of being isolated and oppressed and hopeless. You don't have to go. One more time. Pull out that response of Nehemiah. Oh no. Oh no. You don't have to go. It was just an invitation. He's not forcing you to do it. Nehemiah, I am doing a good work. I am confident in my assignment. No, I will not go because I will stay focused and I will be found faithful because I am God's handiwork. I am created in Christ Jesus to do good works for which God has prepared an advance for me to do. I will say no, because I've got something greater and I've got something higher and I'm working on something great. Nehemiah said, because if I come down and talk to you, if I give in, I will be distracted from what I know God has called me and assigned me to do. I will remain focused. I will remain faithful to what the Lord has set out before me. And he has been working on this all the days long, even when I was just a wine taster. God's been setting this up. He's been planning the whole thing. And so I know, and that's how I know that this is it and I will be found faithful and focused in my assignment. And you have the ability to say that too. I have the ability to say that too. 
This is the last thing the Lord was showing me this. Remember the place where it all began with Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter one. Some people would call this the secret place. This is where the, the battles are really won. This is the power, this is where we find the power to stay the course, to stay focused and faithful in what God has called us to. This is where we find the power to walk in step with him who has called us. And the reason that this whole series and this message is not a self-help message is because this power does not come from you. It is not willpower. It is not self-help power. Help myself. Let me do it on my own. You cannot do it without him. And that is so good and freeing to know. He's gone before you and he's with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. This is the power that came to Nehemiah only after he was on the place, in the place of being flat on his face, mourning and weeping, being wrecked before the Lord and in repentance. And we know that the best revivals that we've ever seen have started with repentance. If we want to see rubble turn to revival, that's where we start. You cannot do it without him. So how, can he, how could he say no to the enemy over and over from chapter two to chapter six and seven? That's how, because he started there and he received the power from God from a place of intimacy to stay focused and faithful. Right after Ephesians chapter two, we see Paul's prayer for the church. And this is so ready to go for this. Ephesians, Paul's prayer for the church says now to him, now to God, who is, who, who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine, according to his power at work in us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. It's, a, it's, it's his power at work within you. It's been his plan all along. And he's prepared for you in advance an assignment. He's had it in the works since the days of old when you just thought it was just a mere paycheck, but he's been equipping you and calling you for the thing that he's assigned you to do, a good work for the kingdom. So before we pray and close, here's some questions for you. What are you focused on? So if your soul is really like a city, how's your walls? How's your focus on the assignment? What are you focused on? The second question is, where is your source of power and strength? From yourself? From God. And third, what has God been doing and preparing in advance for you? And this can only be seen this can only be discovered. This can only be found when the Lord speaks to you in that place and you have that moment with him like, oh my gosh, you've done that and that and that and that and you've been preparing and you've been making a way all for this. I didn't even know that, God, because you do go before me and I am your handiwork created in you to do the good work that you planned in advance for me. God's call on your life, his call on your life was not a pocket dial. It is for you and only you. He's planned it out. Stay focused and be found faithful. Amen. Would you stand and would you pray with me? Let's go to that place. Let's go to that place. If you're comfortable with it, you can... Open up your hands as if you're receiving a word from the Lord. All I'm asking is that we would just take a moment and go to that place. Nehemiah chapter one, where the battles are truly won, where our, our assignment is discovered, a place of full surrender. Surrender and obedience is not a once in a moment, once we're done, it's a series of moments after moments of surrender over and over and over in this place. So here we are. Oh God.
God, I'm thankful that our strength and the power and our, our courage to say no to lies and to distractions comes from here, right here. I'm so thankful that I don't have to figure out how to do it on my own. Like you literally gave Nehemiah the answer. I was, I was a cupbearer. He didn't have to figure it out on his own. God, so here we are and, I, and we all ask that you would reveal it to us. God, we surrender everything that we are and all that we have to you. Break our heart for what breaks yours. Open our eyes to see the need around us. Give us the power through your Holy Spirit to say no to the lies and to the distractions. God, and reveal to us the good work that you've prepared in advance for us to do. Help us, Lord, stay focused. God, and would you find us faithful? Find us faithful. Come, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, we all pray and say, amen.